Hey Psych class, welcome to Unit 2C. This is our first video on our topic of sensation and perception. And so Unit 2C is going to end our unit on uh, the biopsychological domain uh, where we've talked about you know, the nervous system and the brain. We've talked about consciousness and, and sleep and, and drugs and their effect on consciousness. And now we're going to round it out with uh, sensation and perception. And so there's a lot of stuff in this video, so remember the beauty of it being a video is that you can pause it and, and, and go back and write down uh, the necessary things that you need. And so let's take a look first at this lovely picture. Uh, what in the world is that? Um, I'll give you a second here. Pause if needed more time. And the majority of people will tell you that this is some sort of dog, usually a Dalmatian because of the black and white spots, um, sniffing the ground. Don't know if you can see that there. Um, that's the answer that you get uh, f the majority of the time. Honestly, this is a picture of nothing. It's a bunch of black spots on a white background. Uh, but the human brain is super cool in that we're always trying to make sense of the world around us and make sense of the things that um, our senses uh, bring in from our environment. And that leads us to the main difference between these big words for Unit 2C. Uh, sensation is the process by which our sensory receptors and nervous system take in stimuli from the environment. And perception is the process by which our brain organizes and interprets that information um, and um, usually tries to make meaning and make sense of what it is we are hearing or seeing or feeling. And so sensation, think biology, like the basics of like how does the eye see light and how does the ear hear sound waves. Um, how do skin cells respond to pressure? Um, we all take the information in the same way, uh, but not all of us are going to interpret it the same way. And so that's the difference between sensation and perception. Um, this wouldn't necessarily be anything I would, you know, make you write down for your notes, but just some, maybe some examples of this, um, that our, our senses have kind of evolved to fit the needs of our environment. Um, I have two uh, labs at home, Labrador Retrievers. They uh, s smell uh, and hear much better than we humans do. And so here's some more examples, right? Like frogs have cells in their eyeballs that respond only to small, dark moving objects, you know, like bugs so that they can find food um, and that if you put a frog like in a cage with like just a bunch of like dead flies if they're not moving it's, it's like they don't even see the food source um, male silkworms have odor receptors that can detect the uh, like scent uh, of the female um, even a mile away and uh, human ears are most sensitive to frequencies that include things like voices um, especially babies crying and so um, yeah our senses kind of evolved to fit the world around us. Okay, this we're back to the stuff that you should be writing down. Um, let's talk about what your senses do, and then we'll work on perception later in the week. But your senses are going to take information in. They're going to receive it. They're going to transform that stimulation into a neural impulse, which is called transduction. And they are going to deliver that neural information to the brain. And so there's, you know, transduction is just the process of, of converting one form of energy into another. All right. And so like your eyes, the cells are sensitive to light sources. And so they will send, uh, they'll transfer that information to a neural impulse that your brain understands and send that information via the optic nerve to the brain. Um, this is why, I don't know if you've ever been tired and you, and you like rub your eyes really hard and you kind of get these like floaty, like, uh, light sensations. Um, that's not, even though your eyes are closed, right? Uh, that's because you're pressing on your eyes and those little cells in your eyes only understand light energy. And so when they send the message of, hey, we're being stimulated to the brain, I it's interpreted in the form of light, even though in that case, it was actually pressure that was stimulating those cells. And so we'll, we'll play around and do some demos in class to explain all of that. Okay. 
obviously you probably know and again you don't have to write these examples down but there are some things that we can't sense as humans we're not su superhumans uh, we're just regular old people and so we can't see like x-rays uh, radio waves ultraviolet waves infrared light um, we can't hear very high and very low frequency sounds um, there are other animals that use stimuli that we don't even have senses for like birds ha you know having like knowing which direction to fly in the winter you know it's like built in uh, bats and dolphins and their use of sonar um, bees and ants um, seeing the polarization of sunlight uh, for oh look that's cut off uh, for you know finding their food sources Okay, these are important words to write down. Um, how much stimuli does it take to even have a sensation? All right, and that is where we are going to talk about absolute threshold. That is the minimum stimulation that's needed to detect a particular stimulus about 50% of the time. Like, how far away can you see light in the dark? Uh, what's the slightest touch that you could feel? And so everybody's absolute threshold, you know, is going to vary slightly, but there are some averages. Like what can you detect 50% of the time? The things that you can't detect the other times are, are viewed as subliminal input or something that's below the absolute threshold, but could still be detected unconsciously. Um, the unnoticed information can cause priming, uh, which is setting us up to perceive or remember things in certain ways. And so I'll show you some examples of priming in class, uh, like things that subliminally could be given to you that will make you feel or interpret something a specific way. Um, Subliminal messaging and priming were misused in the whole uh, backmasking trials, right, of the 80s that we talked about uh, in class. And remember, we listened to some examples of those. Um, uh, you know, subliminal may prime you, but subliminal messages by no means make people like unconsciously or secretly do stuff. And so more examples to come in class. Uh, again, here's just an example, no need to write down, but audiologists, right, if you ever had a hearing test in elementary school, can find uh, what volume level you detect 50% of the time, right? And so that would be like how good is your hearing or how good is your eyesight uh, um, with a, your eye doctor testing those sorts of things. Um, one other threshold besides different or absolute threshold is difference threshold. That's the minimum difference or change between two stimuli required for detection 50% of the time. And so those two rectangles up by the word threshold, are those uh, the same color or are they two different colors? Um, one, the one on the uh, right has slightly more uh, blue in it than, than red. But to most of us, those look pretty much the same. And so um, how do we know the difference between things, colors, or for example, a parent being able to recognize their own kid's voice on the playground um, versus the, you know, um, just background noise of other children uh, laughing or crying. Uh, Weber's law, uh, this is uh, related to the difference threshold. Uh, and so a psychologist discovered that um, for something, for two things to be perceived as different, they have to differ, differ by a constant minimum proportion rather than a constant amount. And so an example of that is that if I had you hold out your arms in class and I put, you know, a five pound weight in your hand, um, you and I put five more pounds in, you would notice the difference between five pounds and ten pounds. But as I keep adding weight, um, just adding it by a constant amount, like five pounds, there's eventually going to come a point where you're not going to be able to tell much of a difference, let's say, between like a hundred pounds and a hundred and five pounds. And so that's where Weber's law comes into play. And so this uh, just kind of shows you a chart, like light has to kind of differ by 8%, uh, weight usually has to differ by 2%, uh, and sounds or tone have to differ by 0 0.3. So you can see um, humans are much better at determining differences in tone than we are necessarily in some of our other senses. Okay, um, your senses do have the ability to adapt. So let's take a look at some examples of that. 
Uh, when we talk about adaptation, we talk about the reduced sensitivity in response to constant stimulation. And so a great example of that is if you've ever been in a room that kind of smells funky, after you're in there for a while, you kind of don't notice the funky smell anymore. Uh, that's your sense of smell kind of adapting. Your brain gets bored being sent the same uh, stimuli all the time. Um, but there is one sense, right, that that doesn't adapt, thank goodness, and that's your sense of sight, right? How about uh, staring at your computer screen right now? That would be bad if staring at it meant that eventually your eyes adapted and, and reduced in sensitivity and then just uh, the PowerPoint disappeared before your eyes. Um, and so we don't necessarily realize it, but your eyes are actually constantly moving back and forth in an attempt to send the brain new information. And that's why things in front of your eyes don't necessarily disappear right our eyes move too much to burn the image in and so here's an example of that this looks like something out of some sort of science fiction movie but if we actually like prevent uh, a person's eye from moving and give them well we don't prevent the eye from moving but we hook up this camera that moves with the eye so that um it's like the eyes not moving. You can see what happens to images from, uh, you know, a person's face to a triangle to um, series of letters to words. Right, that that elements of it will begin to disappear as a result of sensory adaptation. Right, keeping an image moving along with the eye, and the image disappears in fragments. Okay. Um, perceptual sets. Um, this is going to be something uh, that we continue on with in our next video, in our next assignment. Okay, and so the important thing here is that you have understood the difference between sensation and perception and that we um, will understand that taking the information in is, se is sensation and then the details of interpreting that we will actually talk about um, in our next video. So you can end with this. What is this a picture of? I guess that you will find out next time. So thanks for listening.